and welcome to this lecture on the mysteries of Adolfo. In this uh, session, I'll be uh, looking uh, briefly at uh, the purposes of reading uh, the Gothic novel. We'll be then revisiting the concept of Gothic sensibility in relation to Emily St. Herbert, Valencourt, and uh, the Gothic villain. We'll also be looking at the nature of the family represented in the Gothic novel in um, this session. So the purposes of reading, let's uh, take a, a look at this concept in relation to the mysteries of Udolfo. So what does happen uh, in this uh, fiction? Udolfo is a novel in which the worst is always feared but never happens. Emily is not raped or murdered or married off to a villain or faced with real ghosts. So all the horrors are anticipated but it doesn't happen. And we realize that that is a tendency of gothic terror. Uh, there is a foreboding, uh, a, a kind of a fear of things to come, but it doesn't materialize. So how do we understand this concept of uh, fear not materializing for uh, the central character? And what does the reader take away from this uh, set of circumstances? Durant uh, states that a critic called Durant states that a reader conscious of the patterns of this experience might eventually decide that since the worst had so repeatedly not yet come, it never would. And uh, this could be a lesson um, which can be taken uh, for the real world from this fiction. Um, a person might kind of anticipate um, several horrible things uh, to happen uh, in his or her life, but it may never come. So it's a heartening experience. It's it's a uh, it's a a, a moral lesson um, for the reader uh, not to fear uh, too much in real life. So that that is a, a kind of a fortifying um, message for oneself that uh, can be taken away from this uh, novel. Okay, that's, uh, that's one way to look at it. So uh, Durant argues that this would be logical, correct, and ruinous to the reading experience in Adolfo. So while such an experience may be right, uh, nothing bad may uh, happen for a heroine. And if a reader comes to understand that, um, it might sometimes uh, spoil the reading experience uh, for the reader. Uh, Durant argues that objective distancing kills taste and leads to apathy not only in the characters of the novel but in its uh, readers. So um, the distancing, the rational side of the reader as well as the character will destroy the experience uh, for the reader and um, on the incidents that may happen to uh, him or her in the novel. So. It also uh, urges on its audience what it shows in its heroine, uh, a powerful imagination which consistently takes appearance uh, for reality. So imagination is of the essence. Imagination is important not only for the character, um, but also for the reader in order for the reading experience for a gothic novel to be very potent and powerful. Uh, if Emily St. Albert had not been imaginative, the novel would not have been very interesting for the reader and um, it may perhaps not uh, even be interesting for the uh, heroine herself. Life may not be so interesting for the heroine uh, herself. So these are some of the implications that we can draw from such a criticism. And there are two uh, uh, ways. Um, in which this imagination can be approached. If you remember the previous lecture, uh, we saw critics are arguing against imagination, um, uh, kind of finding fault with imagination and uh, stating that because Emily St. Aubert had been too imaginative, um, you know, uh, complications had risen for her. Uh, if she had controlled her imagination, things would not have been uh, too uh, miserable. So you can see how here uh, imagination is important. Um, it, in, it is in fact key um, for both the heroine, um, for her to make life interesting, as well as for the reader to make the reading experience very powerful and significant. Now, this uh, important topic of Gothic sensibility has to be revisited. In the mysteries, uh, in the first volume, 
sensibility first helps to establish the stability of that ideal paternalistic society. So even though there are negative elements to too much sensibility, sensibility as an ideal is important to establish that morally good paternalistic uh, society uh, in which a, a benign father uh, overrules or lords over the society which is uh, represented through the uh, family unit. We can see in Gothic sensibility um, a kind of an indulgence in sen sentimental virtues uh, happen. Uh, for example, within a series of protective enclosures, um, such as on the Chateau of La Vallée and her father's care, Emily is able to cultivate and uh, indulge in sentimental qualities, so, which are a quick responsiveness to nature. A, a, a response to nature can appear in the form of her interest in artistic taste uh, and an impressionable uh, nature to elements of beauty displayed in nature and an unreflecting generosity to others. So these are some of the qualities which are indulged by Emily St. Aubert during her um, uh, life in uh, this uh, chateau under her father's care. Emily's father uh, in the mysteries of Adolfo does give her uh, very strong advice as to um, the nature of sensibility one should possess. He advises her, I quote, um, and this quotation is from the novel, above all, em my dear Emily, do not indulge in the pride of fine feeling, the romantic error of amiable minds. Those who possess, really possess sensibility, ought early to be taught that it is a dangerous quality which is continually extracting the excess of misery or delight from every surrounding uh, circumstance and since in our passage through this world painful circumstances occur more frequently than pleasing ones and since our sense of evil is i fear more acute than our sense of good we become the victims of our feelings unless we can in some degree command them so in this um, advice of um, Emily's father, we can see that you know too much sensibility can cause a, a lot of trouble for the one who possesses it. Uh, in fact, one can even become proud uh, of possessing that feeling, fine feeling. So um, excess, sentimental excess, um, the ex excess of sensibility can damage amiable minds. That is, um, very very impressive minds. Uh, therefore. Um, the father advises that uh, you know this dangerous quality has to be tempered, has to be moderated in nature, and it has to be managed by the person who is possessing it. And um, one of the problems with this um, uh, excess of sens sensibility is to kind of extract the maximum pleasure out of um, any good thing. Say, for example, beautiful sublime landscape, and and this might be uh, problematic. And he says that since evil is, uh, since one's ability to kind of perceive evil or, um, you know, kind of extract the maximum out of a negative impression is more than uh, how one would approach uh, the feeling of good, um, it is possible for a person with excess feeling to be, to become victims unless one is able to uh, manage the sensibility and, and command um, that that emotion so it can be a dangerous um, quality it can damage uh, or cause havoc in impressionable minds and therefore it can even affect um, the delight that one can take out of um, the pleasant the pleasing the delightful sensations that can be drawn from the world because there is a possibility that one would also be equally too much affected by a, a, a negative thing as well so uh, even though uh, St. Aubert, the father of Emily, educates uh, her on how to find the right um, mean, the golden mean, uh, in terms of sensibility, he himself is not able to control his uh, emotions in the face of a crisis. Um, therefore, critic uh, Delucia argues that uh, although St. Aubert uh, educates Emily to suppress her emotions and maintain fortitude in the face of disaster, he appears unable to control his own feelings. 
During Emily's first death, the death of her mother, she felt the importance of the lessons which, which had taught her to restrain her sensibility. Never had she practiced them with a triumph so complete. So uh, in this, uh, we can see that um, Emily is able to put into practice the lessons that she had been taught by her father, the right lesson on, on the right way to be uh, um, sensible and, and, and the right sentiments to possess um, at moments of crisis or delight uh, has been really learned well by um, Emily and she applies uh, applies her uh, lessons, the, applies the uh, precepts that have been given to her by her father. So it's very ironic that the teacher uh, fails um, in in a moment of crisis, and the student is able to uh, perform really, uh, um, you know, well, come out successful, and that irony is captured. And it's also very interesting that um, the female, the young female, is able to master uh, the emotions uh, in in the face of a crisis, and uh, uh, unlike the male who is uh, failing uh, miserably at this uh, moment. Emily's victory over grief stands in stark contrast to the reaction of St. Albert, who frequently uh, has to leave his wife's uh, bedside to indulge his tears, uh, to indulge in uh, tears. So um, you can see how sentimental, uh, overly um, sentimental St. Albert has become uh, at this um, crucial moment whereas his daughter is able to manage it so this uh, variation in terms of how uh, the two of them approach um, sensibility is quite interesting to behold because um, this kind of uh, model of sensibility uh, can be traced um, you know in another character um, which who is going to be uh, fascinating to read in terms of how he handles, um, you know, the right uh, sensibility. So uh, let's see what happens in his case. Wallencourt, uh, Wallencourt sensibility uh, is similar to Saint Albert's because he over emotes. Um, throughout the novel, uh, Wallencourt over emotes, and his reactions are without fail disproportionate to the occasion after being reunited with Emily and hearing about her harrowing imprisonment at the hands of Montoni, Valencourt, no longer master of his emotions, elevates his period of suffering, the time he spent gambling in Parisian salons about Emily's ordeal. So uh, a parallel can be drawn between um, the father figure of Emily St. Albert and uh, Valencourt because both of them are uh, over-sentimental and Aubert is uh, overly sentimental at the death of his wife while the daughter is managing her emotions and Valencourt is um, placing a lot of emphasis on his own uh, misery um, at the separation from Emily um, in the face of the great odds that um, Emily faced at the hands of Montoni. So Emily was um, the one who had been in great danger of being assaulted and uh, of even being murdered uh, and, and uh, shipwrecked. But despite uh, all these um, harrowing um, incidents, which uh, actually don't come to uh, cause any real harm to Emily, she is able to manage her emotions um, uh, successfully while her uh, beloved Valancourt is uh, kind of being excessively sentimental. So this is how he uh, behaves. Uh, instead of greeting uh, Emily with apologies and sympathy, he accuses her of being too frigid uh, it's an interesting uh, accusation uh, that Valencourt throws at Emily. Uh, he says that she is not uh, being very um, affectionate or not being, um, you know, uh, not being able to relate to Valencourt at his own uh, uh, level, which is with excessive sensib uh, sensibility and sentimentality. He addresses um, Emily in an accusing manner. Instead of greeting Emily with apologies and sympathy, he accuses her of being too frigid. Uh, is it thus you meet him, uh, whom uh, once you meant to honor with your hand? Thus you meet him, uh, who has loved you, uh, suffered for you? Valancourt overvalues his experience in the casinos of Paris and undervalues Emily's time away from him, during which she suffered under a constant threat of rape, the death of her closest living relative, and a near shipwreck. So here, it's it, the, the contrast between the two characters are 
really uh, clear. Um, you know, you, you can see the dark side to the excessive sensibility, uh, the excessive sentimentality which a male possesses here, uh, whereas the real uh, sufferings um, that Emily has undergone has not been expressed uh, through her words, uh, you know, in, in, in a manner which is similar to Valancourt. So, you know, the, the contrast between the two cannot have been greater here. Um, and, and here we can see that, you know, Valancourt is not able to match up uh, with the uh, right sensibility that Emily possesses and he doesn't come off really well in this situation and um, he appears weak and self-obsessed uh, and one who cares more about his uh, sufferings um, and the self-centeredness uh, becomes uh, clear in this uh, passage. Now, uh, as I pointed out earlier, it's, it would be interesting to compare the sensibilities of Aubert, Emily St. Aubert, Valancourt with Montoni's sensibility and see um, you know how this villain this gothic villain differs from all these characters um, in fact um, uh, the critic uh, De Lucia argues that Valancourt's overindulgence contrasts sharply with Montoni's excessive restraint the ability to control oneself is uh, what is meant by restraint and Montoni is capable of doing that uh, spectacularly well and um, while we understand that he's able to control himself, it is also an excessive restraint. He is on the other end of this, uh, of this uh, spectrum uh, of sensibility. Although Matoni is often described as a barely contained volcano, Emily observes and reluctantly admires his talent for disguising his true emotions, beginning with his feigned attraction to uh, her aunt madame sharon and extending to his fear fearless uh, and extending to his fearless battles to defend Adolfo from neighboring warlords uh, so uh, this control over one's sentiment is something that is admired by uh, unwillingly admired we have to note that by um, the heroine uh, Emily, who very carefully observes uh, observes him and realizes that he is disguising his emotions. He is feigning attraction. So he is a man who can mask his emotions and project a different one, a different set of emotions to the one that he is feeling, really feeling on the inside. So. The ability to restrain oneself becomes a weapon as well uh, at the hands of this villain. So you can see how uh, while um, Valancourt and, and St. Aubert are being excessively sentimental and, and they kind of uh, fail to capture the attention, Montoni by his um, ruthlessness is able to uh, arrest the attention of um, the reader as well as get the attention of um, Emily, who, uh, while understanding his evil motives, is able to appreciate uh, the manner in which he um, poses before uh, society. And Emily is further surprised that on great occasions he could uh, bend these passions, wild as they were, to the cause of interest and generally could disguise in his countenance their operation uh, in his mind. But she had seen him too often uh, when he had thought it unnecessary to conceal his nature to be deceived on such occasions. So this is a quotation from um, the novel. And in this uh, quotation tells us that Emily is able to kind of see through Montoni. He, he, she is able to kind of break through the restraint in a figurative manner and understand his machinations so as I uh, just pointed out that um, you know the restraint becomes a mask because um, he's able to kind of um, project a particular set of emotions um, which may be necessary for this uh, for a particular uh, scene in which Montoni is present in order for him to get what he wants so he is able to bend to kind of uh, play with his uh, wild emotions, make his uh, emotions malleable, um, control his uh, wild passion so that he can achieve what he wants. So this is how uh, he becomes uh, really uh, ruthless and powerful. So it is a weapon, it is a kind of a strategy that he kind of powerfully wields and Emily can uh, see that and uh, while she is 
kind of uh, you know disgusted and um, you know fearful of Montoni she is also able to kind of understand how he is uh, playing his game in the novel so we do understand that Montoni is not the social being um, unlike Valancourt and St. Aubert uh, while Valancourt and St. Aubert are morally good and are useful members of uh, society in general. Um, you know, Montoni is quite uh, the contrary uh, to these figures. And uh, unlike Valancourt and St. Aubert, Montoni does not find any value in the sophisticated qualities, um, in the refinement that women possess. Um, and introduce into society. So uh, that's one key contrast between uh, Montoni and Valancourt and St. Aubert. Now, let's come uh, to Emily's sensibility very quickly. We, we realize that she feels deeply like Valancourt, but she does not express um, excessively. She exercises a restraint, a kind of a stoicism, which is associated with Montoni's character, but it's, she is not um, savage. She doesn't possess that savagery, that wild passion that Montoni possesses, and she doesn't use sensibility to manipulate the feelings of um, others. So that's the difference, the crucial difference between the heroine and Montoni, even though they both practice restraint. Uh, Emily's self-command, combined with her ability to feel appropriately for her fellow humans, sets her apart from the other characters in the novel as well. So she becomes a model of um, the right kind of feeling um, in her ability to be generous to others and her ability to kind of express the right taste. She becomes an icon of what is perfect in relation to sentimentality. The notion of... Um, Sensibility can also be connected to this idea of mindfulness. So unlike a Valancourt and Montoni, Emily is also extremely mindful to the needs of others. Um, it also uh, makes it clear for her, um, her purpose in life and her connection to other people in the society. So uh, the sufferings of others, whatever might be, whoever they might be, called forth her ready compassion, which dissipated at once uh, every obscuring cloud of goodness that passion or prejudice might have raised in her mind. So she also uh, was not kind of proud of her ability to help or assist as others. So that is uh, very, very important uh, in, in the nature of Emily's mindfulness. Now let's look at um, the Gothic villain and the nature of his uh, masculinity. So we understand uh, very clearly that uh, Montoni is a misogynist and he has complete dominance over women in this um, novel. Uh, in fact, uh, in his term, self-control means complete abdication of female uh, control and will to male sublime uh, power. So he expected women to kind of give up their control, uh, give up their, um, you know, uh, power, uh, whatever they possess, to give up uh, their property as well as we saw from his um, pressure that he put on his wife to um, make her give up her property. So it is uh, a masculinity which controlled everybody under his clutches. So uh, it's, it's a kind of an aggressive, toxic masculinity that we see in this gothic uh, villain. We also uh, realize that he is unprincipled, uh, dauntless, cruel and enterprising. Uh, he can be resourceful um, if need be. And we, as we saw in uh, Emily's reading of his character, he was able to manipulate his emotions to, in order to gain what he wanted. And um, he seemed uh, to fit him for the situation. So his character is perfect for that uh, you know, society in which he dominated. And it's a society which was made corrupt by him. Um, so that is something we need to understand. Uh, he delighted in in the tumult and in the struggles of life. He was equally a stranger to pity and to fear. Uh, his very courage was a sort of animal ferocity, not the noble but impulse of a principle such as inspirits the mind against the oppressor in the cause of the oppressed, but a constitutional hardiness of nerve that cannot feel and that therefore cannot fear. So we, we do get a list of characteristics of, of Montoni in this uh, criticism. We, we see that, you know, um, when we read the novel also, we realize that he's extremely unprincipled, um, you know, one who terrifies his uh, victims. He's um, 
dauntless. He doesn't give up easily. He's cruel and, and resourceful, and he delights in causing misery. And there is no, um, uh, you know, trace of a noble uh, impulse, uh, a noble principle in his mind. And, um, you know, he doesn't kind of support the cause of the oppressed. In fact, he is the oppressor, and he is very, very hard. He's very, very strong, just as if he's a force of nature. And, and uh, you know, just as uh, nature doesn't fear anything, Mentoni doesn't seem to fear anything or anybody. So uh, what is the purpose of such a characterization? One could argue that uh, Radcliffe kind of critiques the old style of masculinity. She reveals the effect of Montoni's unrestrained violence on the community. And, um, you know, while she is doing that, we can also see that, um, you know, uh, St. Albert is held up for praise as well as being benign and caring and, and uh, nurturing. So um, the old school of masculinity which is oppressive, is kind of criticized um, in uh, this novel by Radcliffe. Now, let's look at the concept of the extended family and uh, the effect it has on the uh, heroine. Uh, Montoni's attempts to marry Emily to Count Moreno in order to restore the family's financial fortunes are stoutly resisted by the heroine, but at the cost of her personal freedom. So what do we understand from this set of affairs? Emily goes to live with uh, her aunt and her husband, Count Montoni, because her parents are dead and, her, um, and she is financially not able to live by herself um the for this um you know a forcible arrangement um the arrangement that's forced on her um which makes her live with her aunt the extended family results in this set of complications for emily so she loses her personal freedom and for long stretches of the narrative she's cut off from the outside world within an enclosed domestic environment in the castle of Vidolfo, where even servants and returners spy on her so this is a really um disastrous uh, position for her to be in but uh, in which she is forced to be because of the setup uh, of this extended family gothic and patriarchy so what is the relationship between the two montoni's strongly patriarchal conception of the family unit means that Emily counts as no more than a property to him as her primary male guardian and he reacts with considerable hostility to all efforts she makes at self-assertion. So this is the connection, the patriarchy which is at the heart of that um, family unit um, in which she is stuck, uh, makes her property to the uh, uh, male who is head of the family. So um, she is at the uh, mercy of Montoni because she has no other uh, male guardian. And, and she has to kind of um, be at his will. And whatever she attempts to assert herself goes in vain um, to a certain extent. So this is the relationship that you can see between um, patriarchy and the Gothic genre in this uh, fiction. So um, Montoni believes that his will is sovereign um, and that everybody else's um, will becomes subject to his uh, pleasure and her individual desires, Emily's personal you know, uh, predilections and preferences do not matter when weighed against the needs of the Montoni family honor as he interprets it. So she has to serve his honor, his family, you know, uh, and um, she cannot rest. It's just it's such a family structure. So since she's an orphan, she has to kind of be fit within another family unit, the extended family unit. And these are the uh, drastic consequences that she has to suffer for it. So Montoni proves to be the patriarchal head of a family uh, writ large and therein lies the complication for this vulnerable uh, young heroine because that uh, head of the family is uh, evil. Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.